So uh, my name is Sam Goldberg. I'm the president and co-founder of Lucidity. And I'm here with my co-founder and CTO, Miguel Morales. And we're really happy to show you uh, a demo of our Layer 2 infrastructure. Um, this has come up, Layer 2. What does that even mean? Why is there a Layer 2? Well, it's because there's a Layer 1. Sometimes it's referred to as root chains. Those are the Bitcoins and Ethereums of the world. Fantastic technologies. Uh, but for our industry, the digital advertising industry, the Layer 1 root chains have some issues. And specifically, those issues are scalability, high frequency throughput, and privacy. And so that's why we built a Layer 2 infrastructure. And our Layer 2 infrastructure consists of a side chain that in turn consists of shards, S-H-A-R-D. I spell it out because anyone that's seen Along Came Polly might think of something else, and that is not uh, the case here. Um, what we have built is specific uh, blockchain product. We don't have another product. We didn't start with another product. We are industry veterans, however. Uh, Miguel and I and our third co-founder, Sam Kim, we've worked together for seven years. We were three of the first four guys of a mobile advertising company uh, that was founded in 2011. So we've lived a lot of the industry's problems, uh, specifically ones that are industry-wide. And we found that you know, when we start talking about these problems, blockchain can apply really well when you have data discrepancies and trust issues. And those are two things that unfortunately exist in digital advertising and was a big part of the motivation for us uh, building our layer two infrastructure. And so the things that we're gonna go over today is we're first going to show you the, a dashboard that an end user would use, in this case, someone like an ad operations or a, a media buyer even. Uh, then we're going to show you uh, some of the architecture, visuals of the architecture of our back end, which is specifically like the decentralized consensus part, which is when many people talk about blockchain, that's what they're referencing, as opposed to a centralized solution where one party controls all of the rules and how those rules are formulated and can even change those rules on a whim. And then last, we're going to show you a dashboard that actually shows the decentralized consensus modeling, like the actual events and how we validate at an event level. All right? And this is part of how we are able to achieve scalability, high frequency throughput from multiple parties, which of course is critical. Uh, and that's what we'd like to show you today. Um, so with that, I will give it to Miguel to start going through the first dashboard, the advertiser dashboard. Cool. Thanks, Goldberg. Um, yeah, just again, uh, my name is Miguel Morales. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Lucidity. I also uh, sit on the IAB's um, blockchain steering committee. Um, and so, yeah, actually, um, you can also find my, my name on uh, the AdChain white paper. So I've kind of been involved in, in a lot of projects. Um, so today, I'll be uh, reviewing the Lucidity um, advertising dashboard and some other dashboards. So let's get started. So here, um, we can see the Lucidity Advertiser dashboard. Uh, keep in mind, these are a lot of uh, tests and internal campaigns. We can show you live, live data. Um, so you may see some numbers. But uh, so here, basically, you can see all your campaigns, uh, create, of course, a new campaign, and, and see kind of get an overview of some metrics. Uh, so here, you can see some of the metrics. You have your regular metrics, impressions, but then you have your compound metrics. So these are metrics that were computed uh, by, mo uh, by by multiple parties, and I'll get into that uh, in a second. Um, so you can see all your compound metrics here. Uh, so here is very, very typical if you're familiar with uh, any advertiser dashboard where you have to create trackers and, and copy and paste them into some trafficking platform. You'll, be, you'll feel at home here. So um, first, you can go ahead and create a campaign. So you just fill out the campaign name, uh, the target URL. So this is the landing page. So uh, when the user clicks on the ad, is where they land. Um, and then the trafficking channels. So the, tra the trafficking channels, um, basically, you know, as an ad ops person, I usually traffic your campaign through multiple channels, uh, multiple DSPs, multiple publishers, what have you. Uh, so what happens here, as you select uh, the channel that you want to traffic on, uh, the dashboard automatically creates trackers for those specific channels, and, and you'll see that in a second. Um, you can also specify an advertiser. So if you're an ad ops personnel uh, managing multiple brands, you can. You can assign a brand to a campaign. And the idea here is when, uh, as a brand, you can also log in and view analytics from your point of view. 
Um, and, and so that's kind of the idea also there, and also management. And, and so what you guys are seeing, just so you know, like our front end product, like what someone in AdOps would use is a tracker. Okay, so we're not trying to tokenize digital advertising. We're not asking anyone to make new technology investments. And pretty much everyone that I'm aware of that's ever been in ad operations is familiar on how to use a tracker uh, in a tag. So that's really the product that's in use here, wh which is Miguel showing you now. Yeah. Um, so just um, following that, um, so here, for example, you can once you uh, have your campaign created, um, of course, all the numbers will be zero at first, so you need to actually start trafficking that campaign. Uh, so first, you, you get your trackers. So here's uh, an impression and click tracker. As I mentioned, depending on your trafficking channel, the system will generate macros uh, specific to that channel. So for example, here, uh, we're using AppNexus. And uh, notice how all the, all the macros are filled in. These are specific to that channel. And then you can the AdOps personnel just copies that and pastes it into the DSP and you're good to go, start trapping your campaign. On the back end, we're connected with the DSPs and exchanges uh, to get data, and that's how we're able to compute these multi-party compound metrics. Uh, and I'll get into the technology. So the, the importance of this with respect to, and what we are just showing you with respect to the tracker, is that it's important on the front end to have valid data. And where our industry is going is going towards automation, but automation needs valid data in order to get there. And so we need to know that the inputs into our consensus-driven model is validated in the first place, which is why our front-end product is a tracker and why we get signals from the various technologies along the supply chain. So here you can see our sidechain mechanism So to uh, help you visualize this. So as you can see, uh, we get the pixel from the advertiser, and that's just one, one data point. Uh, but we also get signals uh, up and down the supply chain. There's a lot of actors that are actually not even pictured here, but we wanted to keep it simple. Um, so, you know, we get the, the bits and wins from the DSP, decisions from SSPs and publishers, uh, and ultimately this all goes to the verification protocol, which runs uh, within the sidechain, and it's all then pegged to the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Um, now I'll go a little bit deeper into our technology. If you have read our yellow paper, you'll probably be very familiar. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please ask us, and, you know, we'll, we'll try to get your copy. Um, so. First, let's go into sidechain, that should say consensus, but then the third one is plasma. Uh, okay, so here we have a sidechain. So the way that this works is um, the participants, this is the advertiser, the DSP, the exchange, and so on, um, they send digitally signed events to the sidechain, to this verifiers here. Then the validators, the verifiers come to a consensus periodically, and that, cons that consensus is then memorialized as a new sidechain block within the Ethereum root chain. Um, so here's, here's how you can see how the sidechain actually looks. Uh, so primarily you have a key pair registry. I, I like to think of it as an ad tech registry. So basically here's where uh, entities go and basically uh, establish their, their identity. I'm not talking about user identity here, I'm talking about ad tech company identity. Uh, so here um, I can say uh, like I'm up Nexus, I update my, I set up my public key and then I can start digitally signing events and sending it over to the sidechain. So those are the participants. Um, if, uh, every hour, so currently we have a consensus around every hour, there is an on-chain consensus. So this is an open source smart contract. Basically you open Etherscan and you can actually see the code that generated the consensus. Um, and then that, we call that an election. So we call that a consensus election. Uh, that currently happens every hour. And within that election is a set of metadata, primarily uh, the a Merkle root of all the events that happen. So it's just a 32-byte hash every, every single hour, and that's how we're able to take, uh, uh, take all these events that happen off-chain, be able to represent them on-chain without spending a lot of uh, gas. Okay, so you can't really see here the colors, um, but you, here you can actually visualize um, the layer two and um, the layer one. So the layer one here being on top. So you have your Ethereum blocks, right, that keeps happening, but th then the side chain also has a concept of blocks. So you have blocks inside blocks. Um, and then within that sidechain block is uh, the root, the Merkle root. Um, and so that's the only thing that's stored on chain. Off chain, you have the individual transactions, uh, which is the tree itself. Um, and so this is very important because you can, um, and I'll get into it right now why it's important. Cool, uh, so how do we scale? Um, so traditional systems like uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance systems, uh, which is Hyperledger's default, um, basically slow down as you add validators. Uh, so we implemented this uh, sharding. So we already have uh, throughput through a sidechain, but not only that, but we can actually make the sidechain uh, larger through sharding. Uh, the way that this works is that events 
are, are routed to the to the shard um, at the event level. So so why does it matter that they're routed to the correct shard? Well, what we do is we compute session level metrics from events. Um, and so this is very important because basically think about in a session, you can have a list of all the events that happen across all your players, and then you can have rules. So what we're trying to do is create like business rules, primarily for billable metrics, such that um, when you have all these events, you can create rules, and then the smart contract running within the shards can compute like what billable events or what happened based on the rules and based on the input events that we got from all the players. So, so why Plasma for sidechains? Um, so here's a quote from uh, one of my favorite people. Um, his name's Joseph Poon. Uh, he is the primary author of the Lightning Network, also the primary author of the Plasma white paper. Basically, if you have a blockchain that's not enforceable, it's just role playing. Um, so Plasma is really, it's a way so that you can ensure that your side chain has the same integrity as your root chain. And that's why it's called pegging. And that's why you're pegging onto the, the security of your root chain while still having the privacy. Uh, Plasma, all it is, it's a set of techniques. It's, you can think of it as a standard, so anybody can implement the standard. Um, and also very important, uh, it allows payments. So uh, multi-party, non-custodial crypto payments, um, that's what uh, Plasma allows us. So think about, um, okay, so the first thing, you have events. Secondly, uh, you have uh, rules for how to compute billable metrics. Thirdly, you have payments. So basically, once the smart contract on the side chain computes that a billable event happened, and whether that billable event, how that's computed is based on the rules, um, then it unlocks payments to all the, all the participants in the supply chain automatically and non-custodial. So it means that we don't actually own those tokens hold, or hold on to those tokens. Here's just a visual representation of how uh, side chains work in general. So you can have side chains that are very specific, um, and basically they're all pegged to the root chain. And what it does is just you can increase your computational power while still being pegged to the root chain. On, on this one, the importance here and why we implemented Plasma is to maintain the same integrity, the same consensus integrity and economic integrity on our side chain as exists on the Ethereum root chain. Okay, so one of the questions should be like, okay, great, you guys built a side chain, like that's wonderful. But how do we know that it's valid? How do we know that uh, we can count on it? And that's why you can see our implementation of Plasma, as Miguel said, on GitHub. Um, and so that's why we did that, all right? And that's the whole point of Plasma, is to maintain the same integrity on the side chains as on the root chain. And at the end of the day, what the side chain allows us to do is achieve the scalability and high throughput, as well as the privacy layer for our industry to work, and so we can all be looking at, verify, and audit the same numbers. Right? So instead of all these disparate numbers, we can actually look at the same numbers at what we think of as the atomic level, which is the impression. Right? So at the atomic level, we're talking about validating impressions, so we can all look at and agree because we can audit and verify the number of impressions that have gone through the supply chain. Cool. Um, so yeah, here's the, we also implement within Plasma our UTXO model. So this primarily, uh, this is well described in the white paper, in the Plasma white paper. Uh, it's basically to protect against uh, block withholdings uh, but be, by being able to do a, a mass exit. Uh, you can see the code on GitHub uh, if you have questions there. Um, and then here is a um, visual representation of a Merkle tree. So Merkle trees are very, very important in our system. So uh, imagine um, that you're Coca-Cola. Uh, you shouldn't be able to see Pepsi's data, right? But then at the, again, uh, when you go to that dashboard, let's say you go to a permission, a permission blockchain and you go to that dashboard, well, how do you know that that dashboard didn't modify the data? Secondly, of course, uh, as it's not protected by Plasma, you're more susceptible to 51% attacks. Uh, but more so, like now you have to trust that dashboard, you have to trust that entity, um, and whereas in, in what we've designed, we, we're trying to make it as trustless as possible. So if you're Coca-Cola, um, we'll show you, for example, the Block Explorer, which you'll see shortly, will only show you data for Coca-Cola uh, across your DSPs and exchanges. Um, and so what happens here is, that is considered a leaf. So every row that you're looking at in the block explorer is considered a leaf, and you can prove that that leaf uh, is within the larger set of data without having access to all of the data. Uh, and so this is very, very important, uh, and you'll see it. Uh, well, you kind of see it visually, so visualized in a second. And now we're gonna show you the front end of the back end architecture that we just shared. What we are establishing here is uh, an, we're basically being a neutral third party. Right? or it's a fair playing field, there'll still be winners and losers, for sure, 
but where we can identify and invite those of us that are adding value to the ecosystem so you can be rewarded justly and how you should be. And then, of course, if you're not adding value to the ecosystem, that you'd be exposed on this fair playing field as having not added value. And so we're establishing this neutral third party where you don't have to trust lucidity because you can audit, validate everything for yourself. And that's what you'll see how to do right now. Um, cool. Uh, so here is our block explorer. So I'm sure a lot of you have probably interacted with block explorers, um, you know, the Ethereum block explorer. So it's around the same idea. So you can see um, kind of like what's happening in the blockchain. Um, so every election here is a consensus round. Um, and there's a, f a set of fields, so I'll just go through them. So post status, uh, so an op there's open and close. Open means that the election is still happening. The verifiers are still coming at consensus to a consensus. Uh, the block number denotes uh, where in the Ethereum blockchain did this uh, consensus round take place in. And um, and starts at an end set, it says, like, okay, this consensus round holds data from this date to this date. So here's where you see it starts at an end set. Uh, segments is you can think about it as uh, the number of transactions within within that. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but you can kind of think about it like that. Um, and then the address. So the address um, is the address of the Ethereum smart contract that facilitated the consensus. Uh, so basically here you can actually see how the verifiers are voting. So those are all the transactions. And this, is, this isn't our dashboard. This is straight from the Ethereum blockchain. And then uh, finally, you can see the hash that where the, the verifiers came to a consensus on. So the, this is the, basically the Merkle root here. And uh, also notice how uh, you have to be logged in to, to be able to see data. Uh, so once you log in, you hit details, it'll show you the data that's only relevant to your account. Uh, so that's what you're seeing here. And then again, the, uh, again, you can see some fields here. But, th but the main question here is like, okay, uh, how do I know you're not manipulating the data? And this is where the Merkle tree comes in. So uh, we're adding visualization so that you can actually do this in MetaMask. But the way that it works is each row uh, show displays um, is assigned a Merkle proof, and you can use that Merkle proof to validate that the data that you're seeing belongs in that smart contract if it's in that is if it's in that Merkle root. Um, so that's how we're able to validate. I want to show one last screen, which is the analytical dashboard. Um, so you may be asking, well, how is this like? What kind of new metrics can I get? Right? Um, a lot of the time, like, what is the point of this? Um, so uh, the reason for that is uh, compound metrics. So here, for example, uh, in, your, in your analytical view, you can get down to the app level, the placement level, and see the number of impressions, but also compound metrics. So for example, uh, impressions is the number of impressions where the pixel fired. But uh, a loaded impression means that the pixel fired, but, uh, but the DSP also saw it. And a decision, a decision win impression means that the pixel fired, the pixel fired, the DSP side and the exchange side. And then we're just moving up and down the supply chain. So imagine a view, viewable decision with impression, but no but viewable decision with impression. And so you have like these long names. But the, the idea here is that you create real billable metrics that are computed based on inputs from multiple parties. Um, and yeah. And you'll know that this is an alpha, OK? So Miguel and our, our product team has put a heck of a lot of work into building the back end, right? This is a front-end representation of that. We're still working on a lot of the visuals to make this a lot more user-friendly. But we wanted to keep the dashboards as they were to show you as an alpha so you could really see the different metrics that we're aligning with respect to the protocol and that, that layer two that we built. Yeah. So with that, um, I think we'll, if there's any questions, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, you can applaud. It's cool. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a great question. So, so that's where the idea of multiple parties and also viewability. Um, so, for example, one thing that a, a front-end agent would enable be able to tell whether fraudulent if if it went through the bid request um, flow. That that's uh, that's one thing. But also, um, you can have multiple pixels from the mo so think about of an iframe, right? So the ad runs within the iframe, but then the publisher runs outside of it. Now think of the system gets signals from both. 
And so we're kind of able, so now we get viewability tag, the iframe tag, and the outer tag, uh, you know, as we scale out and get more data points. But that's kind of the idea, is that now you have multiple data inputs, not just one, to be able to compute and, and create real rules for what is a billable event. Yeah, so, so we're not trying to build everything nor solve all the problems. I mean, there's great companies out there that deal with ad fraud, uh, specifically the type that you uh, are concerned about. Uh, and we're interested in partnering with them, not take their place. In the back, please. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know you want it. But so, so repeat the question. <laughs> okay. So, so basically, I think the question is, how do how do I envision this, or how do we envision in the product team uh, for publishers and other entities besides the buyer, like interacting with the system, the analytics, and so on. Um, so, in my point of view, like the Block Explorer, the way the way that I've envisioned it is that if you pr can prove that you're this entity, let's say you're AppNexus, you're gonna see all the data for AppNexus. If you're a publisher, Pandora, you're gonna see all the data for Pandora, and so you just go here and see for so across DSPs. So, so that's kind of like my basic idea. I don't know if we want to expand on that. So, for a publisher, this can have significant advantages. Like if you're a publisher today. And you know, I know some, I'm not saying this is what everybody does, but I know some, like they're not billing off the DFP numbers, right? So they might have to bill off uh, you know, the advertiser's numbers. Well, even if the advertiser shares their login with the publisher so you can see the same numbers on the advertiser side, w and let's say you have 100 advertisers advertising on, on your site, right? Well, you're gonna log in 100 times to see the numbers. And this way you can see all of that data in one place. So there's a very, very big convenience factor as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.